Hello, I am Peter Okocha. Welcome to Focus on Africa, our top stories. It's being called the silent crisis. The UN says more than one million species are at risk of extinction due to human behavior. We have no time to waste. The time for action is now. At least 58 people are killed and dozens more injured when an oil tanker exploded outside Niger's capital, Niamey. Less than two days till voters hit the polls in South Africa, but key issues like land reforms remain too slippery to resolve. Also on the program, it's a boy. Prince Harry has announced that Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, has given birth to a healthy baby boy. Mother and baby are doing incredibly well. Um, it's been the most amazing experience I can ever um, possibly imagine. Um, how any woman does what they do is beyond comprehension, but we're both absolutely thrilled. And in sports, with the English Premier League coming to a close, Manchester City could go back to the top of the table today. Thanks for joining us here on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Humans are rapidly destroying the natural world. That was the warning in a landmark UN report released today. In the latest study of its kind, scientists found that a million species, many of them in Africa, are facing extinction over the coming decades, mainly because of human activity. Our science correspondent Rebecca Morell has this report. From the oceans, to the land, from insects to exotic plants, life on Earth is declining at its fastest rate in millions of years. This is the stark conclusion of a major new UN report, which warns the planet is facing an ecological crisis. The scale of the problem is immense. It's from local to truly global, and it's urgent. We are losing biodiversity at an unprecedented rate, threatening nature for future generations and threatening human well-being. Less food, less water. It is a massive problem and we need to act now. The report details the destructive impact that humans are having on the environment. 75% of all the land on Earth has been severely altered by humans. 85% of wetlands have disappeared since the 18th century. They're now vanishing at a faster rate than forests and plastic pollution has increased tenfold since the 1980s. The backdrop to this is that human population has doubled in the last 50 years, adding growing pressure to the natural world. This small patch of land belonging to the Devon Wildlife Trust, hemmed in by busy roads, is a refuge for the narrow-headed ant. These insects were once widespread, but as their habitat has shrunk, now this is the only place in England they can be found. This ant is one of the last of its kind, but it's vital for this heathland environment. These insects keep the soil healthy, they break down organic matter, and they're also food themselves for birds and small mammals. It might be tiny, but losing it would have a huge impact. The UN says there are solutions though, but we'll need a major rethink of how we use land, especially for agriculture. We'll also need to consume less too if nature is to thrive again. We need to make big change to make this happen. We call it transformational change. So really thinking differently about how we live on the planet. And that means household changes and it also means governance changes. The window of opportunity for nature's global rescue plan is small. The UN says if we fail to act, many species will be left fighting for survival. Rebecca Morrell, BBC News, Paris. Well, as you heard there, up to one million species face extinction due to human influence. But how does this affect Africa in particular? Well, according to the study, by the year 2100, climate change could result in the loss of more than half of African birds and mammals. 
Over 6 million square kilometers of African land is already estimated to be affected by overexploitation of natural resources and pollution. And these figures are especially concerning as Africa's population is set to double by 2050. Well, let's talk now to Dr. Lutando Ziba, who is co-chair of the UN's report's Africa Regional Assessment. Dr. Ziba, not very good news for Africa, is it, this report? Indeed, not very good news, uh, Peter. It, it does confirm a lot of what we found uh, in the Africa Regional uh, Assessment Report, which you recently cited, and also confirms uh, reports from the other regions as well. And I think it is something that we must all be concerned about, and, and I think particularly on the continent. Do you think that as human beings we fail to understand the importance of biodiversity to our very existence? I think we perhaps underestimate it. We, we don't realize really that it underpins every aspect of our life. Uh, for instance, over 2 billion people in the world rely on uh, fuel wood for, for their energy. Uh, more than 75% of uh, the drugs used uh, in cancer cure uh, come from nature or its derivatives. And, uh, and I think that uh, we, we need to appreciate really how nature underpins our existence from fresh air, uh, water, water quality, as well as energy. Basically, every aspect of human life is affected by nature, including our cultural aspects. So we know exactly what the risk is now, but what's the solution? Can we reverse this trend? And if yes, how do we do that? Um, I think there are options, and, uh, and our, our colleagues who were writing and working on this uh, global assessment report have highlighted a number of those, including uh, acting soon rather than later. And uh, we also need to, to recognize that the responsibility starts at individual level, from individuals and how we live within our households uh, to local level as well as national level, uh, interventions, which uh, if collectively uh, work together, then we might also see action at a global level. I think it is encouraging to see that uh, this report was adopted by governments uh, in an intergovernmental process, and, and I believe that that is going to spare commitment towards action, uh, particularly uh, after uh, you know, the, the, the recognition and awareness about the state of biodiversity uh, is appreciated uh, at multiple levels. Dr. Lutando Ziba, co-chair of the UN Reports Africa Regional Assessment, thank you very much for speaking to us here on Focus on, uh, on Africa. Much appreciated. Now, at least 58 people were killed when an oil tanker exploded outside Niger's capital, Niamey. Officials say people were trying to siphon fuel from the vehicle after it had tipped over on its side. Minutes later, it burst into flames, also injuring at least 37 people. Let's go straight to our West Africa correspondent, Louise de Wast. Now, Louise, what more do we know about today's um, tragedy? Well, Peter, here's what we do know. Last night, around one o'clock uh, in the morning, there was a large explosion uh, out, just outside the capital's uh, international airport. This morning, authorities saying that a tanker truck had tipped over on one of the, the highways, one of the motorways, and that people had rushed to the scene to try and scoop up some of the fuel uh, that was leaking uh, when the truck uh, suddenly was set ablaze. 55 people were killed in the explosion. Three later died from their injuries. Uh, more than 30 people have been rushed to hospital, uh, some in critical condition, authorities say. Uh, there was also 25 motorbikes that were destroyed uh, in the fire. What we don't know is why the truck uh, fell, why the truck uh, tipped over. It could have been because of 
poor road conditions. We also uh, don't know what caused the explosion. Uh, the flames could have been sparked by a running engine of a nearby uh, motorbike. Sadly, these accidents do happen uh, in the region. There have been a number of similar accidents in recent years in neighboring Nigeria, uh, but also in Kenya, in DR Congo, in Mozambique. Uh, this morning in, in Niger, the president and other members of the government uh, went to visit some of the injured uh, in hospital, uh, and the government later released a statement uh, calling this a national tragedy. Okay, Louise Duast, uh, West Africa correspondent, thank you very much for speaking to us there. Let's take a quick look now at other stories making the headlines across Africa. The International Criminal Court has said that Jordan will not be referred to the UN Security Council for failing to arrest former Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir two years ago during a visit to the country. He is wanted on war crime charges. The split decision by the five-judge panel reverses the previous decision by the IWC. The Libyan rebel general Khalifa Haftar has issued a message urging his forces to step up their offensive against the capital Tripoli hours after the United Nations called for a ceasefire to coincide with the start of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan on Monday. But General Haftar called on his supporters to increase the determination and strength of their assault. A body has been found in the search for two French tourists and their local guide who disappeared last week while on safari in northwestern Benin. The Ministry of Interior says the body was that of the guide. The group disappeared in Penjari National Park on Wednesday. The state of education across Africa is a source of worry for many governments, none more so than in Ghana, where an investigation has been launched into why 90% of law students who sat their bar exam this year failed. The BBC's Thomas Nadi has more. According to results released by the Independent Examination Committee of the General Legal Council, only 9% of students passed the bar exams, out of a total number of 727 students. Some lecturers at the Ghana Law School had threatened to resign over the mass failures and demanded the results be reviewed. Now the General Legal Council has issued a statement indicating that it is committed to ensuring the integrity of the examination process and outcomes. The committee said that it is expected to provide recommendations that will resolve the problem. We are complaining that some of the questions fell outside the manual, that is our approved syllabus. So they should audit the questions, we want them to also audit the marking schemes. Just neither the students nor the lecturers are giving copies of the marking schemes or the examination reports after the examination. So the students don't know where they are going wrong, even those who don't know where they are going wrong. The lecturers don't know where they are going wrong. Ghana has only 3,000 lawyers for a population of nearly 30 million, which has implications for access to justice. More lawyers are needed in the country. And so it is expected that this current problem at the country's only accredited professional law training institution is addressed as quickly as possible. Thomas Nadi, BBC News, Accra. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News with me, Peter Okwacha. Still to come, Mimi with the sports. In athletics, Eliud Kipchoge aims to make history in the marathon again. I'm Peter Okwacha. The top stories this are an extinction crisis. The UN says a million species could be wiped out because of human activity. Only bold and drastic changes can reverse the trend. And at least 58 people were killed when an oil tanker exploded outside of Niger's capital, Niamey. Officials say people had been trying to siphon fuel from the vehicle which had overturned. South Africans are preparing to go to the polls on Wednesday. And two of the main talking points ahead of those elections are the fight against corruption and the redistribution of land. The latter is a controversial policy allowing the state to seize land without paying compensation. The plan is highly sensitive, touching on race issues and inequalities dating back to the apartheid era. But President Ramaphosa has promised to implement it if he wins. The BBC's Milton Nkosi sent this report. It's the final push for votes ahead of this week's election. And one of the most talked about issues is that of land redistribution. 
Here, the radical leader of the second largest opposition party in South Africa is welcomed by hundreds of people in one of his campaign rallies in Alexandra Township. He has one message for his supporters. Land first, the rest shall follow. We must expropriate it, give it to our people to have a place called home. And so you just had there for yourself what the leader of the EFF, Julius Malema, has told these people. He wants the land. But this is not just a 2019 election issue. This is an apartheid hangover. In 1993, just before the end of white minority rule, we filmed Peter Manaka, whose shack had just been demolished by the authorities for occupying land illegally. If I can change my, my color to be white, I was supposed to have done that long time ago, to be treated like a human being. I mean, to be a black person here, so it's just like a dog. So. I mean, even in a dog is better these days because the white people, they put it in a house. And this is now in 2019, under a democratic government in the same area. Houses are still being demolished. The hunger for land in South Africa is not just about farming. We want the land so that our people can decide. If they want to make it a residential dwelling like we were doing here, we are very desperate for a residential dwelling. We don't have a place to stay. Constitutional experts say the land problem is more complex than just taking over farms. The question is really about where the priority is. The priority is in the urban areas, but that does not mean that there is no problem of the shortage of land in the farming areas. The politicians are using the land debate for political reasons. They are trying to exploit the uh, uh, popular uh, imagination around the question of land. But that should never detract us from the reality of South Africa, that land still remains an important unresolved question. As people arrive to find their houses destroyed, they begin the lonely walk to rebuilding their lives. It is clear that after all the heated debates in this campaign, the land question will still be a serious issue long after the May 8 election. Milton Ngozi, BBC News, Johannesburg. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. It's now time for some sports. Mimi, can City do it? They absolutely can, Peter. Here's more. It's the last stretch of the English Premier League and the battle for the title. Liverpool won their match against Newcastle over the weekend to go back to the top of the table. But kicking off shortly will be Manchester City, who hosts Leicester City. A win would see them go a point, above, a point clear above Liverpool. For Leicester, there's a faint hope that a good result could help them be in the Europa League next season. And Liverpool's Mohamed Salah will miss Tuesday's Champions League semi-final second leg with Barcelona through injury. The Egypt international left the pitch on a stretcher after an aerial collision with Newcastle. Goalkeeper Martin Dubrovka during Saturday's 3-2 win. Liverpool boss Jurgen Klopp says concussion will keep Salah out as they look to overhaul a 3-0 deficit at Anfield. Unfortunately, I can confirm Mohamed Salah will not what is the word? Niente, nada, whatever. Uh, no play. Eh? So, unfortunately. Precaution. No, it's a concussion. So, um, and that means then he's not, he would not even be allowed to play. So, that's it. It's all. He feels, he feels okay, but it's not, not um, good enough um, from a medical point of view. That's all. He's desperate, everything, but we cannot do it. That's it. Now celebrations in the streets, Renaissance Berkan of Morocco and Zamalek of Egypt will face each other in the final of this year's African Confederation Cup. That's after securing wins over Tunisian club CS Faxian and Etoile du Sahel. Berkan shocked record three-time winner CS Faxian 3-0 in the semi-final second leg to qualify 3-2 on aggregate, while Zamalek squeezed through 1-0 overall after a goalless draw at Etoile. 
We clearly see the development of Barkan's level. We do not forget that Sfax has an important history regarding his presence at the CAF Cup, but also concerning Barkan, we have a great confidence in our players and also the responsibility of the club. We wish to realize this dream and win this title. To athletics, when you believe in yourself, anything is possible. Those are the words of marathon world record holder Eliud Kipchoge. He's going to have another attempt to break the two-hour barrier later this year. The 34-year-old's current best is two hours, one minute and 39 seconds. Sports editor Dan Rowan reports. He's already the fastest marathon runner ever. Now Eliud Kipchoge is focused on breaking athletics' last great barrier. Running 26 miles in less than two hours is one of sport's mythical targets. But after his fourth London Marathon win, the Kenyan told me he wanted to redefine what's possible. When I was approached and I said, yes, uh, I want to make history and to leave a mark in this world. It's about humanity. I can break any barrier if you, if you believe it. Yeah. And if you actually trust you on, on, on your team. Until Sir Roger Bannister proved otherwise, right here in Oxford, exactly 65 years ago, breaking the four-minute mile barrier had seemed impossible. Since then, various records have fallen in athletics, but the sub-two-hour marathon is still seen as the ultimate challenge. Two years ago, Kipchoge missed out by just 26 seconds at a specially staged event at Monza in Italy that didn't count as a world record due to the use of numerous pacemakers. The hope is for London to host this next attempt in the autumn, the latest sports venture by Britain's richest man, Sir Jim Ratcliffe, and his petrochemicals company, Ineos. It is almost superhuman, really. I mean, it is unthinkable for any normal human being to run at that pace of 42 kilometres. Yeah. It's quite extraordinary. But, I mean, if anybody's going to do it, Elliot will do it. Kipchoge's attempt will be open to tens of thousands of spectators. The hope that their support helps him to push the limits of human performance. Dan Rowan, BBC News. That's all the sport, Peter. Good luck to him. Many thanks, Mimi. Now, the Duchess of Sussex has given birth to a baby boy who becomes seventh in line to the British throne. Prince Harry, who was present at the birth, said mother and child were doing incredibly well. Well, Ben Ando is in Windsor for us. And Ben, well, we saw Prince Harry there, a very happy new father indeed. Yes, a very happy new father, and I think a very happy day here in Windsor. It's a public holiday in the United Kingdom today, so a very happy coincidence, you might think, for the birth of his first son to be on a day when there are lots of people in Windsor, lots of people coming to see the town, not just from abroad, also people from the United Kingdom. And even here I've spoken to people who said they, they wanted to come to Windsor, they've tried to time it to be here on the day of the birth, and they were delighted to say that they had managed it. In fact, one woman told me that she and her friend were walking around the castle on a tour there behind me when the news came through. She said she felt very emotional at the news. And, and Ben, I mean, forgive me, I'm Nigerian and I might not know this, but what exactly is the big deal? Pregnant woman has a baby. <laughs> Why is it such a big deal? Well, that's a very good question. I suppose the, the reason it's a big deal is down to history. Um, Britain's royal family is something that uh, has that legacy. It's been going for um, over a thousand years. It's something that a lot of people from around the world come to the uni United Kingdom to see. It's something that very few other countries can say that they have. And I think also there is a particular interest in Prince Harry here because he has married Meghan Markle, an American woman. Um, he has made it clear that he is a different type of prince. He, um, for the first time in hundreds of years, actually been into combat, of course. He was allowed to do that. And he's somebody that I think has, has managed through uh, the Invictus Games as well, the charity uh, event that he runs. I think he's managed to um, endear himself to people in perhaps a way that other members of the royal family haven't. Okay, Ben, thank you very much. And indeed, right here on Focus on Africa, we're wishing them all the very best and saying congratulations to them. That's it from Focus on Africa, from me, Peter Okwache, and the rest of the program. I want to say thank you for watching and see you soon.